Welcome to All Systems Ergo, a human factors and ergonomics podcast delving into the fascinating world of healthcare. My name is Fran Ives and I'm a chartered human factors specialist. I'm naturally curious about people and throughout this series I want to explore different areas of healthcare human factors and the people who work in this diverse discipline. Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of All Systems Ergo. When I was putting together my wish list of topics and speakers for the series, both the topic today and the guest were top of my list. Pascal Carrion is a professor in Industrial and Systems Engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and founding director at Wisconsin Institute for Healthcare Systems Engineering. I first became aware of Pascal through the SEEPS framework, which she's spent many years working on and developing. I therefore wanted to talk to her today about seats, her vision and her thoughts. Pascal, welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. I look forward to our conversation. So I want to chat to you today mainly about seats, although it would be wrong of me to say that that's all you're about. You've done so much brilliant work. But I think in the UK at the moment, we're really excited about SEEPS. There's a lot of interest in healthcare about SEEPS. And I thought, who better to put some context around the SEEPS framework um, than you? So when you started working on the development of, of the SEEPS framework, what was your vision for it? Hmm. You know, this is a great question because when we um, started working on developing the SEEPS model, um, it was in the context of a grant that was funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ. Um, and so we and we as a team, and I'm, I'm going to tell you more about uh, the team. Uh, and so our team was interested in figuring out how do we bring human factors into a well-known model uh, that has been used in quality improvement, healthcare quality for a long, long time, which is the Donabedian model of structural process and outcome. And the reason is that our team was very um, interdisciplinary. So there were a couple of people coming from human factors, um, someone, a physician who also has uh, training in health services research, uh, a nurse, someone with... Uh, uh, experience in infection control and uh, and prevention, and someone with experience in uh, informatics, health informatics, and so it made sense to us to try to figure out how could we, in a way, hijack the uh, Donabedian model or structural process outcome that had been used for many many years, and people in healthcare. Uh, in health services research, people who were talking about quality and safety of care, they they knew the model. And when us in human factors looked at that model or structure process outcome, the structure piece, it made sense to us. You know, it's, it's what people do, uh, how they interact with technologies and others and so on. So it just made sense to us that we would plug in uh, a um, a model that comes from human factor. And so bringing together that model of the work system and the SPO, the structural process outcome uh, model of the Nabidian made sense. And um, you asked me about the vision and the vision was, you know, we had a grant and, and we were a bunch of people <laughs> discussing patient safety and thinking about how can we, um, we on the systems engineering, human factors engineering side, plug ourselves, our skills, our knowledge into that conversation? Well, then it made sense to to write about the SIPS model, uh, and so that was that was the vision, really, to figure out how we could um, uh, bring up human factors and that work system in the conversation about patient safety and healthcare quality. Uh, and so that, that was the initial vision. There was nothing, nothing else besides uh, writing about uh, patient safety from a human factors perspective. Mm. Uh, that was the idea initially. Mm. That's really interesting. You know, you, you had a grant, you wanted to do some some work to expand an existing model, bring in human factors. 
Um, you know, when we started off with the SEEPS framework in, in 2006, and, and then this was followed up by SEEPS 2, SEEPS 3, and the SEEPS 101 paper in, in 2021, you know, did you ever envisage that you would have these revisions and this progression of, of the work? Not, not really. You know, when we when we started, there were a few things that made sense to us, and there was there is quite a lot in that 2006 paper um, about the where the patient fits in the um, in the in the model, uh, the ideal process, and the the patient journey. You know, a lot of these ideas were there in the 2006 uh, version. The um, the idea of coming up with these new versions of CIPS 2.0 patient journey and and the 101 uh, CIPS 101 paper they were really in response to either interest from people who were part of our big team mm-hmm. uh, distributed big team or uh, from talking to um, researchers but primarily practitioners and figuring out that we needed to explain some pieces and to clarify some pieces. Uh, and so that was the uh, that was really the motivation behind all of these different versions of, of uh, SIPs. One of the things that people very often ask us is, which version am I supposed to use? And, you know, people think, well, the the one that's most recent is the best. And Mm. that's not at all the way we think about it. Mm. I mean, Mm. there are some core pieces of uh, SIPs and the different um, versions of the model. And and I can Mm. can go over them later on if you want. Um, Mm. But it's not like one is better than the other. It really depends how you... um, what you need, what problem you're looking at, what perspective you're most interested in, mm. uh, uh, and so on. Um, so we think about this SIPS model as a family. You know, that's what I, when I talk about SIPS, I, I talk mm. about uh, the models as a family of models. Uh, mm. Mm. And they are different members of the family and they more or less get along with each other. And, and then you pick the one, you pick the model that really suits your your particular problem, your particular objective, um, yeah, uh, and then and then go from there. Um, yeah. I'm hoping there might be other versions of it, um, mm-hmm. but I I don't know. Uh, you know, the SIPS family, whether it's a family of models or it's a family of people who believe in it and 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 use it. So practitioners, users of SIPS is is growing, mm-hmm. and I'm very happy that the family is growing uh, mm-hmm. around the world, including in the UK. I like the way that you describe it as a family and actually yep. that that really helps to to sort of build that picture of you know each each one brings something different it, it brings its own sort of personality it's its strengths if you like <laughs> and and you know one thing I wanted to to ask you was you know what next for seeps describing it as a family sort of makes it feel like there could be room for an extra person at the dinner table you know this could grow yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's plenty of um, ways that the the family of models uh, could grow. One that I, I I could mention is really that idea of interactions. You know, when we talk about system, um, we we sometimes don't do enough justice to the interactions. Uh, when you look at the Hawk system model and the five boxes and you know I call them the yellow boxes because that's how we've been we've been drawing them uh, since 2006. You look at the boxes and and uh, people get focused on the boxes. You know where does that fit? Where should I yes. put that? Okay, that aspect of the process. Where do I put it? The organization, the task, and so on, and. Uh, and people get very often uh, surprised or disoriented when I say, well, it doesn't really matter in a way uh, because you're asking yourself the question. So what is it that people do in, in with what kind of tools and where and, and how, uh, what's the organization like? But what's really important is how these uh, elements uh, interact. And mm. so I think 
there are many opportunities for figuring out how do we better describe, uh, evaluate, uh, monitor, consider um, all of these interactions. In the SIPS 3.0 model, one aspect of interactions that we uh, highlighted is the temporal dimension. You know, the fact that processes unfold over time, especially from a patient's perspective. So that's one aspect of interaction. But I think there are mm. many ways that the SIPS model could be um, uh, could be further enhanced or described by focusing or by further describing what we mean by interaction. Mm. Uh, so that's mm. one uh, that's one piece. Um, the other piece that's less obvious to many people in healthcare, and I'm not sure what you think about it in terms of the UK context, um, but it's how SIPs can be used to uh, look at a range of outcomes, including well-being or stress or burnout, whatever you want to call mm. it. Mm. And, and uh, sometimes people don't make that connection. Mm. Uh, so there, there's probably some additional writing and clarification uh, and maybe another version of SIPs that could be uh, presented to help people make that linkage between patient mm. safety and worker well-being. Mm. Uh, mm. So those are a couple of couple of ideas, and I'm sure that mm. that many of my colleagues and uh, students and former students have all their ideas. But uh... <laughs> it, it's really interesting you mention interactions, actually, Pascal, because I use um, the SEEPS two framework diagram frequently I've used it today to some university students to help to illustrate what I mean by a work system and I take the headings of people tools and technology task organization etc uh, and, and sort of help to show them how they all sort of fit together um, but I think it, the interactions is and the interactions between those system elements can still sometimes cause people to to panic a little bit you know okay so I know who my people are at tasks I know I know what they're doing where they're doing it um but understanding the relationships between each of those system factors and the interactions can can feel for some people a little bit challenging you know how do they go about understanding those relationships and and how do they understand if they're going to make changes in a system which part of the system they sort of press on and, and what impact making a change in one element will have on on other parts of the system because obviously what we never want to do is to solve one problem but create 10 <laughs> 10 more um and also in in healthcare particularly at the moment with it being so complex and so pressured it can be hard to know where do i start you know which part of the system do I start with which part um, am I going to have the most impact in um, or which which one or two changes do I make and that can be really hard for people to sort of think where do I start with this yeah 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 no I think I think your summary of the challenges with the interactions um, uh, I mean, the challenges you're describing are really right uh, on target because there is one aspect which is you know in an abstract manner, when you do an analysis is where that that's related to that. Well, it's nice to talk about it and you know to draw a roles and and to have a conversation uh, about that, which which is really important. But then there is the piece about how do you go from there to okay, now what is it that I'm going to change? So mm. what's my let's call it intervention or mm. redesign. Um, and so then that intervention is going to impact something in your system. But then that's the next step is to really think about that intervention in the context of the system, mm -hmm. that it's never just filling the blank. You know, <laughs> I, I very often uh, talk about um, the technology piece because I've done a lot of research and projects on, on health information technology. And and that's what I hear very often. Oh, Pascal, don't worry. It is just a piece of technology. It's like, ah, <laughs> to me, that's a big red flag. Uh, so, so helping people understand, no, it is not just 
a piece of technology or it's not mm. just an intervention. And so when I start describing my intervention, how I, how can I do that? Describe that intervention as a system. And so helping people in that um, in that second phase of going uh, beyond the analysis, designing an intervention, mm. and then implementing it and learning from it. I mean, mm. this is tough. Uh, mm. And um, I often get asked the questions like you, where do I start? Mm. And I say, well, I don't know, start somewhere. And then you might be making mistake. And I know mistakes are things, of course, we try to avoid in in healthcare but we know that in complex mm. systems there's stuff that's going to happen you know that mm. concept of emergence to me is stuff mm. is going to happen mm. uh, and so we need to be able to uh, implement something and and learn from it and i think mm. that's what i picked up in the patient safety framework mm. uh, improvement framework is that that learning uh, mm. which i think is is critical mm. uh, because it's not just doing an analysis, figuring out the intervention and implementing it is stuff is going to happen and you're going to have to continue uh, mm. going back to the system, analyzing it, improving it. It's, it's, it's a continuous improvement process. Mm. And so, um, and that's a big, big change of framework and big change of uh, how people think about patient safety. You know, in the mm. good old days, we used to have the list of, 10 patient safety improvements and then it became 20 and then 25 <laughs> and it it's not like that mm. uh, and so uh, helping people understand those interactions in the context of the analysis mm. figuring out your intervention and then knowing that when you change something is gonna is gonna uh, produce effects i don't like the term mm. of unintended consequences but mm. it's going to produce consequences whether they are positive or, or negative you mm. need to be aware of that and mm. look for them and then learn mm. and, and continually improve uh, mm. so those those are challenging um things for people to um to grasp because that's not how we've done patient safety and patient mm. safety and for many years so. mm. I do like the simplicity of your advice in terms of start somewhere. Yeah. And I think that's often the hardest, isn't it? You know, you're thinking about people who are um, using SEEPs for the first time. You know, I've got to get this right. Where do I start? Actually, just have a go. Start somewhere. Yeah. It may be that you kind of backtrack a little bit or or start again. But the simplicity of just have a go and start somewhere uh, and move forward and I, from and there. Yeah, and I know what what your experience is but it's also thinking about how SIPs can be applied in all kinds of different contexts for all kinds of different people at all levels of organization and so when we talk to top level leaders managers da 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 is is also helping them understand what um what SIPs means for them Mm. Uh, and what it means for them as as a leader, as mm. as uh, um, as someone who has to make decisions about uh, system mm. design, because that's that's what they do. And mm. also thinking about people at all levels of mid level managers or supervisors of mm. unit or team leaders or uh, a nurse, a physician, a pharmacist, a receptionist, and how they have their own system. Mm. And so how can people at different levels um, do things for their own system as well as the systems that they supervise, mm. or how can they move problems up the ladder? So I'm, I'm a strong believer of top-down, bottom-up, middle you know, out of whatever <laughs> levels, because that's what it's going to take. Uh, it's mm. not just the top, it's not just the bottom, it's all of all of those levels uh, walking mm. together. Mm. Uh, and if people really understand that uh, they are part of that system, you know, mm. any one individual, whether it's a patient safety officer, it's a nurse, it's a care team, it's a patient, they are part of a system. What can mm. they do 
to uh, improve that system? And what is it that they can, of course, there are probably many things that they cannot do. Mm. Uh, who do they need to involve and um, mm. how do they get in, them involved? Uh, mm. But um, I think what you're describing of, of people being almost paralyzed by a SIPs analysis, that's not really what, what we intended uh, mm. to achieve. We really wanted people to expand their horizon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but for the good. You know, because yeah. if you expand your horizon, you figure out that there are many things that need to be fixed, not just that one, and go for it. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a journey. Uh, I think those words will be incredibly reassuring to people, Pascal, who are, who are looking at SEEPs for the, for the first time. Um, you've, you've touched upon the Patient Safety Instant Response Framework, which was launched in 2022 here in the UK. And... And this really sets out the NHS's approach to developing and maintaining effective systems and processes for responding to patient safety incidents. PSERF promotes a a range of system-based approaches for learning from patient safety incidents and SEEPs features features heavily there. Um, So for many in healthcare, this will be the first time that they've they've heard about SEEPs, the first time they've interacted um, with SEEPs. do you have any other golden nuggets about where these people begin um, and, and how do they start to to understand and get to grips with using SEEPs? Well, maybe, uh, I mean, I think there are a couple of things. One is, is maybe just applying it to themselves. Oh. Uh, think about yourself as um, in, in the center, you know, that person in the center of the system and, and what are what are your the elements of your work system and then what are barriers and facilitators or pluses and minuses in in your system um and other way of thinking about it is is um uh, uh think about a a patient safety incident or problem that has been really um bugging you or or recent one and then start asking yourself the questions of who were the people involved? What were they doing? Um, what tools and technologies uh, were they using? Mm-hmm. What was the environment like? What was the organization like? And so, you know, I'm a very visual person. So when we've done uh, SIPS training, that's what we do is we give people a lot of white paper and post-it notes and markers and and um and have in front of them the SIPs model to help them understand what are the questions you need to ask. Mm. And very often that's that's what it takes is you know a reminder that oh it is not just blaming the person. No, it is not just blaming the IT people or the, <laughs> the technology mm. people. Oh uh, and so and so going through that sy- systematic list of questions. Um, mm. About each of the each of the elements that are involved in a particular particular uh, event or a case study. Mm. Uh, I mean, we've done a lot of training using some of the case studies that the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has made available on their website, um, mm. the Web M M&M. and um, And so, and so, helping people go through that analysis. Mm. Uh, with those five questions, you know, questions mm. about each of the each of the five uh, elements, um, and so that's 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 a good way to get started. Mm-hmm. And then once they do that, then the list is really long. <laughs> <laughs> they start looking, and, you know, and then we go back to what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Is the list of uh, pluses tends to be pretty short. <laughs> The list of minuses tends to be pretty long, but I think we that's the other thing is is helping people understand also also what are the the facilitators or the strategies, mm. uh, which is the other aspect of the facilitator is strategies that people have developed to do their job, to deal mm. with barriers. Mm. And so making sure that that you identify those because very often that's where the solutions lie mm. uh, to deal with the barriers and so. I find it really interesting when I'm um, talking to people, you know, down on the ground, um, observing their work to actually identify and explore some of the workarounds that people have done. Because, 
you, you sometimes see some really simple workarounds, um, sometimes some really complex workarounds, but it gives you a real insight into what the challenges are that people yeah. have experienced. But also people who are doing the job often know what they'd like to do if they had a magic wand and they've often tried to 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 find out you know what what will work um you know I've, I've seen some some great workarounds in 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 my time have you got any classic workarounds that you've observed that stick in your mind what's the best one that you've you've ever seen oh god the post-it notes <laughs> <laughs> So I think I mean every little piece of paper you see on 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 a doorknob on on a medical device on yeah. uh, on a medication drawer or uh, whatever I mean those post-it notes are are just wonderful <laughs> <laughs> things to uh, things to observe um, but you know that concept of walk around is really interesting but for the longest time it was kind of a dirty wand you know. Mm. We don't want them. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, there are quite a lot of people, in particular in human factors, talking about walk arounds as strategies. Mm -hmm. And so talking about them more as solutions, that's what mm -hmm. you were talking about, mm -hmm. uh, rather than, than safety problems. And so that conversation of walk around has evolved, I think, in, in a very positive way. And of course, there are walk arounds that, that uh, that endanger safety, but very often they're also walkarounds that actually enhance uh, safety. Uh, and whether they enhance or, or have a negative impact on patient safety, there are things that we need to capture and learn from. Uh, because mm. like you said, they're really telling us that something is not well designed in the system and people are trying to do their job. I mean, I think that's mm. a basic assumption of human factors is mm. people want to do their job, they want to do a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, those uh, walk arounds are strategies that very often they develop to do their job in conditions that are sometimes very adverse, not enough mm -hmm. time, not enough resources, not enough information, uh, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, and so so learning learning from those. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it you know it's fascinating because I talked about the post-it notes. So you asked me about. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do I do we identify uh, those things? So post-it notes. The the other thing is is we've observed a lot of people uh, in their context, and very often they just don't realize they're doing it. And mm -hmm. so having an outside person who is who can ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, can be very valuable. And so this is why I think the idea of um, um, having more and more human factors, experts and professionals in healthcare is, is critical mm. because we're not clinicians. I mean, some people may, may have mm. the dual mm -mm. background, uh, but we have a different way of thinking about mm. things and, and looking at things. And sometimes we ask strange questions uh, that don't make sense, but very often we ask pointed questions yes. uh, that may help identify a problem or a solution. Uh, mm. And so again, that interdisciplinary mm. uh, way of looking at patient safety, including walk around, is is really really uh, valuable. Um, I remember when I came into healthcare in two thousand and four, I'd. I'd come from the nuclear industry and prior to that, the automotive industry. And I found coming into healthcare incredibly daunting because I didn't come from a clinical background. And it took me a while to sort of recognise it and build up my confidence as well to, to know that it was OK to ask the simple questions. And actually, they were often the questions that really needed to be asked because I was able to go into um, environments having no prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I could legitimately say, can you explain this? Or, oh, I'm really interested. Why do you do it this way? Mm -hmm. And those are some of the most powerful questions, I think, because you can see the cogs turning in yeah. people's brains as they sort of, they think to themselves, I don't know why I do, why, why do I do it that? I'm not yes. sure. <laughs> um, and just sort of taking things back to basics 
and going in with that sort of objective viewpoint, I think, along with a curious mind, which I think is absolutely critical in, in human factors, um, can really be incredibly valuable. It's almost your your most valuable tool, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're right. I mean, I think uh, being able to do it in, um, in of course, uh, um, a manner that respects people and their yeah. and their expertise, but vice versa. You know, it goes it goes both way. I may I mean I I may ask a really funny question about a medication to a pharmacist uh, that yeah. of course uh, any pharmacy student would know, but that's yeah. okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and and then the uh, the uh, the other way around. Uh, so respecting each other's expertise and uh, mm. uh, mm. and so I think fostering that climate. You know, uh, Amy and Monson talk about psychological uh, safety, uh, mm. but that climate where we can ask uh, questions and and learn from each other is is really important. And I mean, patient safety is way way too difficult uh, to leave it to to one group of people or one one discipline. And we've seen that. We I think most people uh, know that. Uh, but being able to bring that that other perspective. Mm. Uh, is also what we bring as as human factors person because we ask different questions and we look at mm. things differently. Mm. Um, so that's that's really uh, that's really important. Yeah. One of the things I really love about um, you know being able to work alongside people um, in in healthcare is working alongside is actually sometimes the best education, isn't it? I spent a lot of time in our A and E department a few years ago, and what I saw after the piece of work I'd done was quite a few requests coming through or, or contacts from from staff and the A&E department weren't um, particularly special in the number of human factors yeah. challenges they had yeah. but what I saw was the requests were changing from don't really know what to do here to I've had a go could you come down and, and have a look and actually it was it was really lovely to see that by me asking you know some some really sort of simple questions and and helping staff to look at things objectively and and putting people at the, the center of the the system they'd started to be able to adopt some of that thinking themselves and actually look at, at you know say the design of a form and think do you know what this isn't this isn't working um yeah. But also trying being able to understand why it wasn't working and and then able to do something about it. So I think it can be really useful to people in departments to help them take a step back by asking those questions. You, you're helping them to to look more objectively at that work, which can then lead them on to identify um, their, their, their own solutions for problems that have probably been bugging them for some time. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a great point of how do we how do we help people we meaning people in human factors um, how do we help people in healthcare? There's never going to be enough of us, uh, and so I know there's a big push about figuring out how do we train more human factors people, how do we hire more people, mm. uh, more human factors people in healthcare mm. uh, like you and and your colleagues. This is critical. Um, but I'm sure your experience in other industries has been like there's never enough of us. And so we need to figure out how do we have people do human factors, even if it's at the basic level. Mm. Um, you know, Nigel Collett mm. uh, said a long, long time away, how do we give ergonomics away, human factors or ergonomics away? Mm. And there are people in, in the discipline that say, oh, no, you know, you need like three years or five years of training. Yeah, sure. But what can we do to help people get started on, on that journey mm. and figuring out things on their own? And they they won't have all of the human factors knowledge that mm. someone and I have. Uh, mm. That's okay, I guess. Uh, I mean, mm. you need to organize and coach them and and help them mm. uh, learn. Uh, but I think there is a lot that we in our discipline need to do to develop tools, methods, approaches, mm. list of questions, um, checklists, whatever, 
things that uh, that we can give to um, people in healthcare at all kinds of levels so that they can do uh, some of that work mm. on. Mm. If they are willing to learn, then let's figure out how we can help in their learning journey. Mm. I'm a great believer in supporting people with an interest in human factors to develop that and and one thing I've seen over the years is as I've been talking to groups of people about what human factors is you know I've I've had a few occasions where I've I've seen people in the audience have a penny drop moment oh so that's what it's called and these people have often been very instinctively approaching things in in a, a system way putting people at the center without really knowing why it just instinctively felt right to them mm -hmm. and so when they sit and hear a, a, a basic introduction lecture into human factors they join all the dots and they they realize oh there's a science behind this um and because i've come across this happening a few times i've really felt you know there are people who they may not have all the right tools and the processes but they've got that that inner fire, if you like, that that drive to make improvements because they want to make things better for people, not yeah. because they want to get, um, you know, uh, waiting lists down or, or more patients through the system. It, it's it's actually thinking about the people. Um, and I feel with those with with that group, you know, they're keen and, and eager to to actually learn. OK, well, what are the, the tools or the frameworks I can use to develop this? Um, and I have my own experience of, of being a sole practitioner in a trust and being the only qualified HF specialist and finding it really lonely and really hard. And actually, when you find other people who are interested, uh, you can actually do a lot more as a group. You have different levels of knowledge. Some people are very um, much at entry level, but somehow together, you know, it's that power in numbers, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that that power of uh, of networking. I mean, I think again that you know networking is about building that system, and so yeah. uh, figuring figuring out how do we uh, how do we create those networks internal as well as external networks. You know, connecting people like you in different different healthcare organizations in the UK or, or around the mm. world. I mean, frankly that issue of being the only human factors person in a healthcare organization is something that's that's experienced more and more by more and more yeah. people yeah. Uh, yeah. all over all over the world and so how can we help all of you uh, mm. uh, talk to each other and mm. share tools and and techniques and and tips mm. but also help each other because like you like you said it's like wow I'm the only one how am I going to mm. do that uh, and so uh, not only figuring out the numbers within your own organization, but also the numbers across the world, so that mm. so that you can uh, uh, you can help each other. Um, mm. But if I, I I I was just as you were talking about about that idea of um, presenting human factors and and um, and encouraging people who. Uh, for whom that makes sense. Um, I've I've often uh, heard people when we present SIPs, it's like, well, that makes sense. No, I mean it's, I mean in a way, it's a, it's a pretty simple model. No, it's mm. people and they are doing things and they're using tools and all of that in a mm. physical environment and organization. Of course, that makes sense. Mm. And so, to me, what's really interesting is the in quotation simplicity of the of the work system model within SIPS. I mean, it has huge power because it, it's, a, it's an easy way, it's an easy point of entry. You know, it's an mm. easy conversation to have with people. So what, mm. what is it like for you? You know, what 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 are you doing? And and then in your in your head you start thinking about all of these five elements. Mm. Um, and then it's and then to me it's peeling the onions, you know, it's adding layers of complexity. Mm. Then there are interactions. It's not then it's not just your system; it's the people you're working with. Mm. So now it's a system for a team. 
uh, well, what about the system for the patient? And so I think it, it, it's an, to me, it, it's a nice way of building a learning pathway mm. uh, for people interested in uh, improving things for patients and, and for mm. workers. Uh, mm. Because the more you learn about it, the more there is to learn. And um, and it's not just seeps, is 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 there's all kinds of things that you need to know, mm. uh, kinds of things in human factors that you need to know about mm. usability, the physical environment, and whatever you name it. I mean, the list is pretty long. Our mm. handbooks are pretty <laughs> are pretty big. And so I think mm. that's the other thing is is that that um, idea of taking people on on the learning. Uh, journey and and uh, and creating that um, maybe initial frustration or it's like oh my god that list of problems is long what am I going to do to mm. this is a journey we're going to win it together for <laughs> mm. uh, for a long time and there are many many other things that we can we can learn together so mm. Mm. that's powerful um, yeah <laughs> and one of the things I like about seeps is that you know, I say to people, even if it just gets you thinking about other elements in the system that you wouldn't have thought of before, then that's a real step forward. You know, I think we can all, um, you know, think of examples of where pieces of equipment, for example, have been bought because perhaps they were at a really good price or they had the latest technology. And actually, when they've had been brought into a, a healthcare setting, we find out actually it doesn't link with our IT systems or um, it doesn't fit through the door. It, it doesn't, it, 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 we can't hear the alarms over the background noise. Um, and these things often then just get sort of pushed away into a cupboard. We'll, ju we'll just forget about that expensive mistake. Um, so even if people start to think about, okay, we're, we're buying a new piece of equipment. So who are all the users and what are all the possible environments that we can use it in? And what are the tasks that we're going to be doing with it? Even if they just think about those, it may well just sort of pick up on some potential problems and, and, and traps that they may have uh, fallen into. Um, if they go no further, then I still think that's progression and a, a real benefit to staff and to patients. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that I think that's probably a challenge for the uh, uh, your patient safety uh, framework is um, that that you're going to be uncovering you collective, all of you, mm. you're going to be uncovering uh, things that. Um, are also going to need their own systems approach. You know, you were talking mm. about purchasing equipment, mm. which of course is is very important from a safety perspective. But then there is also the designing equipment. So who mm. are who are the designers? You know, designers are people, mm. and their job is to design that piece of equipment. And uh, they also have their own work system. Uh, and and who are the intermediaries and 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 so on and so I mean I think there are all kinds of systems subsystem system of systems you know you you then you start mm. using the fancy system terminology but it's really connected context and 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 systems uh, mm. that are going to need their own analysis and improvement uh, and mm. so on so it's. I mean, I think to me that's a, the exciting thing is is observing what's happening in the UK with um, your patient safety framework, uh, and and in particular the use of SIPs and and seeing how hopefully it's going to grow mm. uh, in in many in many domains that are connected mm. to uh, to patient safety. Mm. You make reference to the use of SIPs in the UK. <clears throat> Have you got a feel for how SEEPS is being used in other countries? Well, we actually, there's a group of us within the International Ergonomics Association uh, that that's working with WHO to, mm -hmm. uh, to see how SEEPS and the HFE systems approach that SEEPS represents mm. uh, could be incorporated in a global patient safety action plan. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, so that's uh, that's work in progress. Mm. Uh, I'm I'm hopeful, uh, but if you think about how complicated it is at a country level, <laughs> at a WHO level, it it's uh, it's at least as complicated. So that's uh, that's one thing. Uh, mm. So that's that's my that's my one of the things that I've been working with uh, mm. with other people within the International Ergonomics uh, Ergonomics Association. So. Mm. so I think you know it's so all too easy for us being in the UK to to sort of not not think about its use beyond our own country and um, you know what what we could potentially learn from the way it's used um and integrated into patient safety in in other countries so that's something for us to keep our ear to the ground on and um yeah see and, what and then learning... how, how yeah and how what you're doing can inform what's happening in other countries including at the international level so i think this is this is really important and so there's an there are a number of your colleagues in the UK that are involved in that IEA International yeah. Ergonomics Association project. So I think it, it's important to have that two-way, uh, mm. two-way learning, learning from you and vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. So I was going to ask you, um, what what are you working on now that we're going to see in a few years' time? But you you sort of answered that in the in your um, uh, in your last response. But you know. I suppose I want to know what's what's next from you. You know, what what gets you motivated? What gets you excited? Um, what's the next thing that you want to to be doing in human factors? So th- there are, there are a couple of a couple of things. One thing I haven't talked much about uh, is uh, patient, mm-hmm. and in a number of our uh, more recent projects, we've been working more and more with patients. And so, you know, that's what SIPS 3.0 is about, is really thinking yeah. about things from the, uh, from the, uh, from the uh, patient uh, perspective. And so um, really doing justice to what we talked about in SIPS 2.0, where we describe what professionals, what healthcare workers do, what patients do, you know, the work of the research of Rich Holden and Nicole mm-hmm. Werner, Rupa Valdez, and many others in that area is really important, but also what patients and clinicians uh, or healthcare workers do together. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that that has been a lot of the, uh, the more recent projects, including one that we're doing right now in, uh, in, um, an emergency department in emergency department or what you call A and E. Yeah, extra uh, emergency yeah. Or, or emergency <laughs> department. Yeah. Um and so and 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 emergency departments or A and E and E departments are really interesting because to me it's 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 like wow, it's they're moving really fast and uh and there's so much interdependencies uh with the before and the after that uh that there's huge huge opportunities for for improvement and redesign but that means we have to really think about the role of uh the role of patients uh so um so thinking thinking more and more about uh the role of patients and you know i'm i'm an engineer and so i'm really interested in redesign i mean i i like doing the analysis but i'm really I, the projects that I've enjoyed most have been projects where I can do some redesign and, and figure out new methods and new ways of doing redesign. And then, of course, writing about it and, and uh, learning about it. And so some of the work that we're doing right now uh, that we're writing up has been about uh, how to do some of that redesign uh, with uh, the involvement of patients. And then uncovering all kinds of potential conflicts. Uh, you know, that's what system redesign is about, is very often trade-offs. And so uh, figuring out how do we do redesign by achieving good outcomes for both patients and uh, and healthcare workers. Um, and then the other thing, and that's why I, I'm, I'm really watching what's happening in the UK, is I want to write more about SIPs and our experience. So, you know, talking to you today is... Uh, 
is is great. It's it's very helpful to share some of my experience. But I also want to write more about about some of the work that we've done, so that so that I can uh, uh, I can share it more uh, more widely. Uh, and so that's that's my big big writing project. Uh, uh, once I get my uh, my ability to write and type. <laughs> I can, <laughs> Uh, I, I can do that. But, uh, those are some a couple of the things that uh, uh, that I have in the pipeline. No, oh, it's good good to know. There's more. There's more there. There's there's yes. other things for us to look out for and and to to watch. Um, I just want to sort of really finish off. Um. You know, if you've got any advice, just some some nuggets of advice for people who are really starting off with their human factors journey, you know, what what would you say to them um, in terms of where to start or what areas to focus on or any real words of encouragement? Oh, this is I mean, I think this is a fascinating discipline to be in and, and especially especially in healthcare. Um, I mean, I think there's so much that that we need uh, we need to do and we need to further develop. I mean, you know, earlier on you were talking about when you you're working on some of your projects or talking to some people. Sometimes solution is pretty easy. You know, it's it's mm. what you learn in your first year of training, and and then you uh, you can propose a solution pretty easily. But there are some other solutions or aspects uh, that uh, I think are really challenging us in in our in our discipline, and so it's uh, and so that's what I um, I find really fascinating, and that's where I encourage a lot of people to look into this uh, this discipline because there's huge opportunities for lifelong learning mm -hmm. uh, and and for. Uh, I, job security in a way, you know, uh, there mm -hmm. are so many problems that are not going to be solved uh, mm -hmm. very easily. Um, the the other thing is, I'm I'm reminded as when I was a PhD student, my advisor Mike Smith was very keen about having us go out and and talk to workers and and do observations and and. Uh, I see you now. It, it sounds mm -hmm. like that was also part of of your training. Mm -hmm. And so, my experience as as a as a PhD student was actually to go to our university hospital and spend a few hours in the intensive care unit. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I sometimes talk to my students about it, and mm -hmm. that that was that was a huge huge experience. Uh, and so, um, helping people who are just starting to get connected to, mm. you know, following a patient or going to uh, being able to do some observations or talking to nurses or physicians or pharmacists. Mm. So being exposed to, to, that, to that environment um, in a, um, uh, as a researcher, as a learner, yeah, uh, I think is 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 really really important because you realize very quickly that oh my god they need help, <laughs> uh, and I I can help them. Yeah, I can help them now, and 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 if I commit to that to that uh, profession, I'm going to be able to have huge huge impact uh, mm. on people who in the end you know have huge impact on us. Uh, mm. Because they care for us and and our loved ones, so I think mm. that's that's the other part of the uh, of the mm. equation. I find fascinating mm. at what we do in healthcare and patient safety is mm. uh, we're helping many others and we're helping uh, mm. our friends and and families and and also us. So that's mm. what I would. I think that's really great advice, Pascal. And um, I was nodding along furiously because, you know, one of the things I love about human factors is being able to get out into environments, watching people, talking to people, you know, and certainly from from being this profession a few years, it it it, it never fails to fascinate me. 
you know, yeah. what people do, the care that they they give to patients. And as you say, you know, we could be patients one day, our friends, our families. And um, th- there is always something that we can do. You know, sometimes I would go out to places and I think, oh, my goodness, I don't have a clue what I'm going to be able to do. But there was always something that I could recommend, even if it was small. But that there was there was never an occasion where I came away and thought, there's absolutely nothing I can offer here so it's a hugely satisfying profession to be in absolutely absolutely I mean I think what you're describing of of also those relationships uh it's not only relationships with our with our colleagues and and um other human factors professionals and and researchers but it's the relationships that we build with within healthcare, whether yeah. they are healthcare workers or patients and uh, and care partners and so um and, and learning learning from them mm. uh, as well as uh, them learning from us. Absolutely. I think that's a great way to finish Pascal. So thank you so much for our conversation today. I've i thoroughly enjoyed talking to you, exploring SEEPs a bit more, but also moving beyond that and and talking more widely about healthcare so thank you you're welcome friend thank you very much that was great did you enjoy pascal had such a clear and down-to-earth way of explaining things and she was really interested in how people use seeps on a day-to-day basis in healthcare until i got in touch with pascal and started chatting about the episode i didn't realize that she was really curious about this area but of course why wouldn't she be So for those of you who are using SEEPs, I hope you learned something from Pascal. I know I certainly did. Thanks for listening and look out for the next episode.